May 1780, Charlestown, South Carolina, has fallen to the British. The Commander-in-Chief, having established order in Charlestown, and having marked general line of conduct to be observed throughout Carolina, towards the friends and enemies of Great Britain, began to make arrangements for his return with part of the army to New York, which had been particularly exposed to the attempts of General Washington, owing to an uncommonly severe winter. Previous to his embarkation, he planned several expeditions to march into the interior parts of the country, one to move up the Savannah River in Georgia, another to pass the Saluda to 96, and a third under command of Earl Cornwallis to cross the Santee River, and by marching up the northeast bank to endeavor to strike Colonel Buford's corps, which was retreating to North Carolina with artillery and a number of wagons containing arms, ammunition, and clothing. Earl Cornwallis left his ground near Huger's Bridge on the 18th of May and directed his army to Linus Ferry with five pieces of cannon and upwards of 2,500 men. Boats were collected with some difficulty to pass the troops. The Americans, having concealed or destroyed all within their reach to retard the progress of the Royal Army. By the information of Negroes who discovered where some were secreted, and by the assistance of carpenters who repaired others that were damaged, the light troops were not long prevented from crossing the river. As soon as the Legion and the detachment of the 17th Dragoons had passed, Lieutenant Colonel Tarleton received instructions to march to Georgetown in order to chase away or take prisoners all the violent enemies to the British government and to receive the allegiance of the well affected. This service was performed without any opposition. During the passage of the other troops, on the 22nd the army moved forwards upon the same roads by which Colonel Buford had retreated ten days before. The infantry marched to Nelson's Ferry with as much expedition as the climate would allow. From this place, Earl Cornwallis thought proper to detach a corps consisting of 40 of the 17th Dragoons and 130 of the Legion, with 100 mounted infantry of the same regiment, and a three-pounder to pursue the Americans who are now so much advanced as to render any approach of the main body impracticable. Lieutenant Colonel Tarleton on this occasion was desired to consult his own judgment and to the distance of the pursuit or mode of attack. To defeat Colonel Buford and to take his cannon would undoubtedly in the present state of the Carolinas have considerable effect, but the practicality of the design appeared so doubtful and the distance of the enemy so great that the attempt could only be guided by discretional powers and not by any antecedent commands. The detachment left the army on the 27th and followed the Americans without anything material happening on the route except the loss of a number of forces and the consequence of the rapidity of the march and the heat of the climate by the pressing forces on the road the light troops arrived the next day at Camden when Lieutenant Colonel Charlton gained intelligence that Colonel Buford had quitted Rugley's Mills on the 26th and that he was marching with great diligence to join a corps then upon the road from Salisbury to Charlottetown in North Carolina. This information strongly manifested that no time was to be lost and that a vigorous effort was the only recourse to the prevent the junction of the two American corps. At two o'clock in the morning, the British troops began tolerably refreshed, continued their pursuit. 
They reached Ruglis by daylight, and they learned that the Continentals were retreating above 20 miles in their front towards the Catalba settlement to meet the reinforcement. At this period, Tarleton might have contented himself with following them at his leisure to the boundary line of South Carolina and from thence have returned upon his footsteps to join the main army, satisfied with pursuing the troops of Congress out of the province. But animated by the alacrity which he discovered both in the officers and the men to undergo all hardships, he put his detachment in motion after adopting a stratagem to delay the march of the enemy. Captain Kinlock of the Legion was employed to carry a summons to the American commander by which magnifying the number of the British might intimidate him into submission or at least delay him whilst he deliberated on an answer. Colonel Buford, after detaining the flag for some time without halting his march, returned a defiance. Sir, I reject to your proposals and shall defend myself to the last extremity. I have the honor to be, etc. Signed, Abraham Buford, Colonel. To Lieutenant Colonel Tarleton, Commanding British Legion. By this time, many of the British cavalry, mounted infantry, were totally worn out and dropped successively into the rear. The horses of the three-pounder were likewise unable to proceed. In this dilemma, Lieutenant Colonel Tarleton found himself not far distant from the enemy, and though not in a suitable condition for action, he determined as soon as possible to attack, there being no other expedient to stop the progress and prevent their being reinforced the next morning. The only circumstance favorable to the British light troops at this hour was the known inferiority of the Continental Cavalry who could not harass their retreat to Cornwallis's army in case they were repulsed by the infantry. At three o'clock in the afternoon on the confines of South Carolina, the advance guard of the British charged a sergeant and four men of the American Light Dragoons and made them prisoners on the rear of their infantry. This event happening under the eyes of the two commanders, they respectively prepared their troops for action. Colonel Buford's force consisted of 380 Continental Infantry at the Virginia Line, a detachment of Washington's cavalry, and two six-pounders. He chose his post in an open wood to the right of the road. He formed his infantry in one line with a final small reserve. He placed his colors in the center and ordered his cannon, baggage, and wagons to continue their march. Lieutenant Colonel Tarleton made his arrangement for the attack with all possible expedition. He confided his right wing, which was composed of 60 dragoons and nearly as many mounted infantry, to Major Cochran, desiring him to dismount the latter to gall the enemy flank before he moved against their front with his cavalry. Captains Cor Corbett and Kinlock were directed with the 17th Dragoons and part of the Legion to charge the center of the Americans, whilst Lieutenant Colonel Tarleton with 30 chosen horse and some infantry assaulted their right flank and reserve. This particular situation, the commanding officer selected for himself that he might discover the effect of the other attacks. The Dragoons, the mounted infantry, and three-pounder in the rear, as they could come up with their tired horses, were ordered to form something like a reserve opposite the enemy's center upon a small eminence that commanded the road, which disposition afforded the British light troops an object to rally to in case of a repulse, and made no inconsiderable impression on the minds of their opponents. The disposition being completed without any fire from the enemy, though within 300 yards of their front, the cavalry advanced to the charge. Upon their arrival, within 50 paces of the Continental Infantry presented, which Tarleton was surprised to hear their officers command them to retain their fire till the British cavalry were nearer. This forbearance in not firing before the dragoons were within 10 yards of the object of their attack prevented their falling 
and to confusion on the charge and likewise deprive the Americans of the farther use of their ammunition. Some officers and men and horses suffered by this fire, but the battalion was totally broken and slaughter commenced before Lieutenant Colonel Tarleton could remount another horse, the one with which he had led his dragoons being overturned by the volley. Thus, in a few minutes, ended an affair which might have had a very different termination. The British troops had two officers killed, one wounded, three privates killed, thirteen wounded, and thirty-one horses killed and wounded. The loss of officers and men was great on the part of the Americans, owing to the dragoons so effectually breaking the infantry, and to a report amongst the cavalry that they had lost their commander, which stimulated the soldiers to vindicate a spirit not easily restrained. Of 100 officers and men were killed on the spot. Three colors, two six-pounders, and above 200 prisoners, with a number of wagons containing two royals, quantities of new clothing, other military stores, and camp equipage fell into the possession of the victors. The complete success of this attack may in great measure be ascribed to the mistakes committed by the American commander. If he had halted the wagons as soon as he found the British troops pressing his rear and formed them into a kind of redoubt for the protection of his cannon and infantry against the assault of the cavalry, in all probability he either would not have been attacked, or by such a disposition he might have foiled the attempt. The British troops in both cases would have been obliged to abandon their pursuit, as the country in the neighborhood could not immediately have supplied them with forge or provisions, and the Continentals might have decamped in the night to join their reinforcements. Colonel Buford also committed a material error in ordering the infantry to retain their fire till the British dragoons were quite close, which when given had little effect either upon the mines or the bodies of the assailants in comparison with the execution that might be expected from a successive fire of platoons or divisions commenced at the distances of three or four hundred paces. The wounded of both parties were collected with all possible dispatch and treated with equal humanity. The American officers and soldiers who were unable to travel were paroled the next morning and placed at the neighboring plantations and in a meeting house not far distant from the battlefield. Surgeons were sent from Camden and Charlottetown to assist them and every possible convenience was provided by the British. This business being accomplished, Lieutenant Colonel Tarleton gained intelligence that the American reinforcement had fallen back upon the report of the late affair. Therefore, on the evening of the 30th, he commenced his march toward Earl Cornwallis. The main army had not moved more than 40 miles from Nelson's Ferry when the first express arrived with the news of the advantage gained by the light troops. A few days afterwards, Lord Cornwallis was joined at Camden by the detachment under Lieutenant Colonel Tarleton with the addition of the American cannon, royals, and wagons, which were delivered to the artillery and quartermaster general departments. Hello, hello, Drakenquellant here, and I hope you really enjoyed this American Revolution content. If you did, go ahead and smash that like button. And if you're new here, welcome! Please go ahead and click that subscribe button to get more content just like this. And remember, take care and don't forget to slay the dragon.